Thank you very much. So uh, my topic today is Indian security policy and the China factor, and I should add that I've actually added a subtitle, which is Growing Cooperation, Enduring Disagreements, and Increasing Rivalry, which uh, goes to say a little bit about the approach. So uh, basically, in the post-Cold uh, post War period, India is increasingly uh, moving away from its previous non-aligned stance. China's rise and India's own uh, economic growth and increased ambitions are factors behind this changing outlook. And since taking up office in 2014, the Modi government has pursued a particularly proactive and forward-leaning foreign policy. The government has worked to engage India's uh, neighboring countries, at the same time also building more comprehensive relations with the great powers. All of this is mirrored in things like the hectic travel schedule of Mr. Modi himself, visiting just uh, uh, in, in two and a half years in office, visiting over 43 countries. And last summer, uh, analysts of Indian foreign policy debated whether Modi's poli pol foreign policy constitutes a change or a continuity. Is it a radical departure from the policies of previous governments, or should we understand it as a product of an evolving process? Now, in this paper, I argue that one area in which we should expect to see such changes reflected is in India's relationship to China. And when it comes to this relationship, I find that we may indeed discern a slight change in India's approach under the Modi government. Over the last months, the tone has become somewhat sharpened. And two main examples show this. Firstly, the matter of the disputed areas has again come to the forefront both in Sino-Indian relations, as well as relating to the triangle, India, China, and Pakistan. And secondly, the debate and the discussion seems to have hardened somewhat with an increase in anti-Chinese sentiment in the Indian public. And today we, we can see a slightly larger willingness on behalf of the Modi government to voice India's views. And the, the drivers, I argue, may be found in the increased Chinese presence in India's neighborhood, the rising tensions over the border, and the rise of the anti-Chinese sentiment. Now, this paper examines three main tendencies that, I argue, uh, mark today's Sino-Indian relations, which are increased economic and diplomatic cooperation, enduring disagreements over Tibet and the border, and the increasing strategic rivalry. Now, these three tendencies make for a great complexity uh, in the Sino-Indian relationship simultaneously encouraging cooperation, but also confrontation. And lately, the confrontational aspects of the relationship seem pushed to the fore. Uh, importantly, China's uh, Silk Road initiative will vastly increase the Chinese presence in India's neighborhood, and also involving the contested areas. And the central role of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC, is absolutely crucial. So the CPEC will connect Kashgar in Xinjiang province with Gwadar port in Baluchistan province. And not only is the corridor meant to connect two very volatile regions, it will do so by passing through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and uh, gilgit baltistan territories with which India sees Indian, but occupied by Pakistan. So uh, going through these tendencies, if we look at the increasing Sino-Indian cooperation to begin with, while both the countries for a number of years experienced exceptional economic growth, as has been pointed out, the balance is quite uneven, and today chi China's GDP is five times that of, China, uh, of India, and the trade deficit standing at 52 billion US dollars for 2015-16. And one of the ways to narrow this gap has been to attract Chinese investment, and in particular in order to revive job-creating manufacturing sectors in India and to major infrastructure projects. Now, in addition, Chinese investments are important in relation to Modi's Make in India campaign. And in 2014, China committed to investments of over $20 billion in India over the next five years, indicating a wish to access Indian markets as the Chinese have slowed down. And lately, Chinese companies have also become big investors in Indian technology startups. Now, if, if we look at bilateral diplomacy, the number of high-level visits and exchanges have increased significantly over the last few years. 
In 2014, Modi received Xi Jinping in his home state of Gujarat, and Modi made a return visit to Xi'an in Beijing in May 2015. And exchanges have been frequent also at ministerial and other levels, with the meeting of the National Security Advisors in Hyderabad early this month as the latest su such exchange. There's also cooperation in a number of multilateral fora, such as in BRIC, and thus both India and China are in need of energy and raw materials and access to new markets. One could imagine that BRICS could have been used as a common platform from which uh, to promote such economic interests, but this has so far not really been the case. And India recently hosted the 8th BRICS uh, summit in Goa, and this the practice, as is the practice, the host may invite neighbouring countries for an outreach summit. Now, following last month's cross-border attack on the Indian Ar army camp at Uri in Jammu and Kashmir, India chose to invite countries belonging to the BIMSEC uh, grouping over those of the SARC. And now this meant leaving out Pakistan, Afghanistan and the Maldives. And as such, the decision was interpreted as an attempt to isolate Islamabad, but also it was an indication of the importance that New Delhi attaches to the Bay of Bengal region. So BIMSEC could indeed have some potential to accelerate uh, regional, regional integration, security cooperation and an increased connectivity. Now if we, if we look at uh, the contested areas and the disputed border, Recent events have brought out the continued Sino-Indian disagreement over Tibet and the border areas. When US Ambassador Richard Burma recently attended the Tawang Festival as India's guest of honor, this was the first time that a foreign diplomat, let alone the US Ambassador, had been extended this invitation. Chinese reactions were provoked. While in line with the US's view that Arunachal Pradesh does indeed belong to India, China was firmly opposed to the visit and arguing that third parties should not interfere in disputed territories. The visit would disrupt the peace and tranquility on the border, damaging the so-called hard-won peace. And in response, the MEA dismissed the seriousness of the visit, calling, an Indian, uh, calling a visit to an Indian province hardly unusual. And similarly, when Arunachal Pradesh's chief minister met the Dalai Lama in early October, a visit of the Dalai Lama to Tawang was planned for March 2017. Now, this move has also provoked Chinese reactions, with the Foreign Ministry arguing that the visit may affect border peace and stability, and damage bilateral ties. Uh, the Dalai Lama's activities were for the, furthermore characterized as anti-China uh, separatism. Now, in response, India has argued that the Dalai Lama is an honored guest of India and is free to travel to any part of the country. Now, as has been commented on by the press, in diplomatic relations, language is of paramount importance. The Chinese referral to peace and tranquility in the border region is unlikely to be a coincidence, as this was the title of a 1993 agreement between India and China, uh, committing the countries to peace along uh, the line of actual control and reducing the number of troops in the area. Reports of Chinese intrusions into Indian territory occur at regular intervals. Figures released by the Indian government showed a doubling of these between 2011 and 2012, and the trend seems to be continuing. Recent events on the India-Pakistan border have also brought out the importance uh, of the India-China-Pakistan triangle and its effect on Sino-Indian relations. Last month, the strike on the Indian army camp at Uri led to retaliation in the form of surgical strikes by India and Pakistani areas. So in the wake of this, China and Pakistan's so-called all-weather friendship has come centre stage again. A series of Chinese moves have strengthened the Indian perception of a strong Chinese support to a Pakistan set on harming India. So India, uh, China's stalling, stalling of having Jaish e Mohammed leader Masood Azhar listed as a terrorist by the UN and China's blocking of India's, India's entry into the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, the most visible reaction is the growing anti-Chinese sentiments in the Indian public, finding an outlet through social media campaigns, encouraging boycotts of Chinese manufactured goods. So the hashtag boycott China products and boycott Chinese goods have gained thousands of tweets, tweets reaching a peak during Diwali, 
uh, when sales of gift items and Diwali lights and crackers suffered somewhat. Chinese exports to India account for only 2% of uh, China's total exports, however, and China stated that the campaign was likely to hurt Indian traders and consumers rather than China, and also negatively affect bilateral relations and Chinese investment. So China recently seems to have also opted for a slightly tougher stand on border issues, including uh, the Jammu and Kashmir areas. China has started a practice of using staple visas to Indian citizens of JNK, as well as to citizens of Arunachal Pradesh. And this practice indicates that China does not formally recognize India's sovereignty of these two areas. Using regular stamp visas would indicate a rec recognition of India's authority. So um, it would seem that India's and China's slightly divergent national interests remain a major obstacle for resolving the boundary disputes. And this again fuels a maintained confrontational stand. And this confrontation is further intensified by their continuing interactions with each other's arch rivals, China with Pakistan and India with the US and Japan. Now, if we move on to strategic rivalry and look at areas of Sino-Indian competition, um, it seems that India's hesitation and concerns regarding the CPEC and China-Pakistan ties are very strongly tied to the growing influence of China in South Asia and in the Indian o Ocean region. Um, so um, China's military capabilities have increased rapidly since the late 1990s. And while India has become the world's largest arms importer and in 2014 had the seventh largest defense budget, China's defense budget is more uh, than four times larger again. So over the last decade, China has systematically engaged with countries in India's immediate neighborhood, such as Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and the Maldives, through economic and military aid. And an active presence in India's neighborhood is not exactly new. Um, if we look at neighboring Myanmar as an example, while uh, India was one of the fiercest critics of the military regime in Myanmar following the 1988 demonstrations, Yangon and Beijing soon built a close relationship. And as the extent of this relationship became clear, India opted for a gradual policy of engagement with the regime. And given Myanmar's own democratization, the country may again see closer ties to India now. Um, and India would certainly want to be the preferred part partner of its neighboring countries in South Asia. But the Silk Road initiatives, however, are likely to increasingly make China a competitor to uh, the Indian interests. And while the initial Indian response seemed somewhat muted, New Delhi now actively argues that India must seek cooperation with its neighbors and particularly within connectivity. So the cur current government has certainly placed India's neighborhood at its top for, as its top foreign policy priority with Modi famously inviting the heads of the South countries to a swearing-in ceremony in May 2014. And in much the same way as China fears US encirclement, uh, India seems to fear a Chinese encirclement. So in addition to the disagreements over Tibet and the unresolved border, uh, China and India have also disagreed over the status of Nepal, Bhutan and Sikkim. And in August 2015, China signed a series of bilateral treaties with Nepal after India had voiced concerns over Nepal's new constitution and following the blocking of Indian goods and fuel to Nepal. China and Bhutan have disagreed on the Doklam Plateau and the Jakarlung and Pasamlung valleys. However, after the 24th round of China-Bhutan border talks in August, the countries now seem to be moving closer to some form of a resolution. And China's lasting interest in Bhutan's Chumbi Valley is obviously of a great concern to India, as it borders Tibet and is close to the Siliguri Corridor. And now Bhutan's hydropower industry is also naturally of interest to both India and China. Given the Indian skepticism towards China's increasing footprint, it is only to be expected that India also should be somewhat concerned about increased Chinese presence in Afghanistan and Central Asia, which the Silk Road initiatives will bring. And as one of the world's largest importers of oil and gas, India would also want access to the oil and gas resources in Iran, Central Asia and the Caspian region. 
Potential Chinese domination in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran would therefore con constitute a considerable challenge to Indian security policy. In April 2016, India finalized the trilateral Chabahar agreement with Iran and Afghanistan, um, which should improve regional connectivity with Chabahar port in Iran as a focal point. Now, looking to the maritime domain, both China and India are stepping up their military naval power and capacities. Now here, India may seem to hold the lead over China in its near region. China's navy still lacks the power project projection capabilities to play a prominent role in the Indian Ocean region. And while China launched its first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, in 2012, India already has three. One in active service, one under construction, and one recently decommissioned. Furthermore, India is planning to build new nuclear attack submarines, and the Indian Navy also seeks to more than double its fleet over the next decade. Now, in May, four ships of the Indian Navy's Eastern Fleet carried out a two and a half month long operational deployment to the South China Sea and Northwestern Pacific. The purpose was dual to strengthen military ties and to enhance interoperability between the other between uh, navies. Now, the Indian ships made extended port calls to Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and Malaysia. And the press statement called the deployment a demonstration of the Navy's operational reach and commitment to India's active policy. The aim was also to show the flag in what was called a region of vital strategic importance to India. The deployment culminated in the Malabar exercise, in which Japan this year participated as a permanent member. Now, China seeks access to the Bay of Bengal by financing the construction of a deep water port in Kyokpu in Myanmar, and India has responded by doing the same in Sitwe, a little further north. And while Chinese investments in port facilities in uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar might seem a far cry from the rumored military bases and Chinese submarines docking in Sri Lanka and Pakistan only to conduct support missions for Chinese anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden, China's presence will still be met with reservation in New Delhi. Last week, the Pakistani and Chinese navies began their fourth joint exercise. Though these, new, uh, these joint exercises are not new, the present one is very significant as it particularly focuses on the uh, CPEC. The development of Gwadar port and the expected flow of trade through it was argued to make trust and cooperation between the two navies increasingly important. Um, and in addition to enjoying what they called solid friendship, Pakistan and China shared waters, waters and mountains which they would protect together. Now I'm just going to briefly uh, sum up in conclusion. So my argument is that the Sino-Indian relationship is marked by these three main tendencies of increased cooperation, increased disagreements, and also increased rivalry. And the drivers behind this uh, development may be found in the increased Chinese footprint in India's South Asian neighborhood, the rising tensions of the border, uh, and the rise of anti-Chinese sentiment. And today, we can see a somewhat larger willingness on behalf of the Modi, uh, Modi government to voice India's views. And as India responds to the growing influence of China, Indian foreign policy has undergone some changes, and this change presently seems to be happening at a greater pace than before. Thank you.